So I looked out the kitchen window and I could see the flames from this house blazing up. So we just grabbed what we could and just ran out. Must have been terrifying. Yeah. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a biggie. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> Money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Got to be up here somewhere, Tommy. I remember it across the street from the church. You're right. It gets in right over here. Oh, I think you're right. Yep, there it is. Looks good. Yeah. Well, good morning. I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to a new episode of This Old House. And today we start a brand new project, although not this one because, well, we've already done this one. <laughs> 41 years ago. Yep. This was the first project. And you know, a lot of people don't know that my dad, my brother, and myself were asked if we would do this project, and we said, well, I don't know about this, this old house and being all the way into Boston. It's a long way to go. So we kind of turned him down, and Norm did it. <laughs> Norm and Bob Vila kicked it off all right here back in 1979. Hi, Norm. Hi, Bob. Wonder if you can talk with us for just a minute. Want to get a closer look at the eaves up here? Sure. We're not working on this house, but we are working in this neighborhood. Dorchester, the biggest neighborhood in Boston, and it has always been sort of a, an entry point for immigrants, always a blue collar working neighborhood, uh, and it still is to this day. And one of the main reasons is because the type of housing it has. Yeah, I mean, look at the architecture here. All the rows of houses right here, they have small lots, but if you can see the triple deckers, three floors of identical living on each floor, and it allows the homeowner to get into real estate. They're able to buy these houses, live in one floor, and rent the other two out. And today we're working on our own triple decker. The homeowner um, has been living in it for almost 40 years. Unfortunately, just over a year ago, there was a fire. Um, so she's been out of the house. Uh, but Charlie and our crew, we're gonna help her get back into it. Gotta get her back in. A year's a long time to be away. Coming up uh, right up here on the right. I think that's it. Let's see what we've got here, Tommy. Oh yeah, just what you'd expect, right? A whole row of them, Tommy. This one here has got uh, three porches stacked over each other, bay windows. Same situation here with our house. Yeah, a lot of windows. Check that out. That's great. Carol. Hey, Carol. Hey. How are you? How are you? All right. Very good, good to, to see, see you. you. Good to see you. So this is it, Carol, huh? The family house? Yeah, this is it. This is my home since 1980. I bought it then, wow, 40 years 40 ago. Years. Wow. 40 years, that's amazing. Yeah. So what was your situation back then when you bought it? I was it? raising my daughter, a single parent, and I bought the house. At the beginning, I had tenants on the first floor yeah. and a tenant on the third floor. So I was on the second floor with my daughter living out of one room. And why just one room? Well, because there were, it wasn't, fixed up. It oh. was had a lot of work and needed painting. There's wallpaper that needs to be done. Yeah. Floor needs to be cleaned. So you move in, you start renovating right away. Exactly. Start <laughs> renovating. Pretty typical. That story yeah. before, Many right? times. Many yeah. times. Uh, so eventually the tenants move out, correct? The tenants move out and then I moved just family in. So it's been family ever since. That 40 year continuous run comes to an end temporarily about a year ago, right? Yeah. We had a fire. Uh, so I can show you the damage in the back. Let's have a look. All right. Um, it started at the house next door. Um, they had fireworks all day. Um, we were just uh, actually going to bed. It was like one o'clock in the morning. So we, um, the fire started here and we just heard people outside yelling there was a fire. It caught the back of my house on the back porch near the third floor. Wow. So I looked out the kitchen window and I could see the flames from this house blazing up. Mm. So we just grabbed what we could and just ran out. Wow. Must have been terrifying. Yeah. Well, if my sister ran the house with no shoes on, she's panicking. Sure. <laughs> I can only imagine. 
I say I'm glad, I'm so thankful that they saved the house and everyone got out safely. Well, that's the important part right there. But I'd love to see the house. Can you All show right, it All right, I can show you the inside of the house. All right, lead the way. I'll go find Richard, learn about the mechanicals. All right, catch up with you later. Come on in. Oh yeah, here's your front foyer right here. This is like a common area. It's everybody's mailbox. Stairway to the second and third floor. You got a beautiful leaded glass window here. Right, I love those. So yeah, they're beautiful pieces. So what do you so got going here? So this is now, it's the living room. Oh yeah, oh wow, this room's in great shape. Right. Floors look good. Because if you had a lot of water here, you'd probably see the floors see. buckling oh, up. Oh, okay. Yeah, from the expansion. Right. This looks like a this dining room. This is a dining room. room. Yeah. Walls look good. Ceiling came down. A built-in cabinet here. Yeah, pretty common. Okay. So this is the... Kitchen. Kitchen. Well, this looks like it's been... Had some work done to it recently. Yes, we had uh, just recently replaced the... I renovated the kitchen and the bathroom. We put in new cabinets, we put new floors down. Granite countertop, yep. tile floors. Yep. Walls look pretty good, except the outside wall. Yeah, because the fire, you could tell here, it started here, but they were actually just making sure there was no damage. Yeah, the we fire. were standing right outside this wall right. here. So this is right. where the vinyl was all melted right. and the charring. So right. here's your back hall that leads up to the second and third floor, the stairway. So this was the kitchen. This was the kitchen. Um, this is mostly water down so far. The walls are all down, but the fire was on the outside, as we could see. Um, so this was renovated, new flooring, new cabinets, and new tile in the bathroom yeah. as well. The bathroom looks like it was relatively new, too. New bathroom fixtures and yeah. tile. Yes. Yeah. And this is the dining room. Oh yeah, look at that cabinet. You can see the leaded glass window. You got a little broken glass right there. And you got a beautiful window right there Stained leading glass. outside. Yeah. Yes. And I noticed the dining room right here is pretty typical. They would actually put this railing right here. Right. This is actually called a plate shelf. And there should be a notch, which is right there, a shelf. That on this shelf, they would stand up plates and the plates would go into the shelf so they wouldn't slide down and fall on the floor. Oh. Pretty nice. All right, so now this is a bedroom. Okay, so we've gone for the natural trim that you have back here, right. the painted trim. Well, I think somebody painted over, but it has to be before I got here, before I bought it. Yeah, so it's been painted for a while. I see you saved some of the cabinets in this granite top, top. from the kitchen. Yes. That's smart. Yep. Great. All right, so what do we got here? This hallway. is a hallway and leads into another bedroom. Nice bedroom with a lot of glass. Great, great. Yep. Now let's, we'll go up to the third floor. Okay, so now we're out in the foyer that we came in downstairs. Right, and it's a front hallway here leading up to the third floor. Wow, this is a big entryway. Yes. This is the third floor. This is my floor. This is where I lived. Yep. And this is my bedroom. And the setup is exactly the same as the second floor. Looks the same, but, but they took the ceilings down in here. I don't know why they took the ceilings down. Oh, well, maybe they're checking for something. Who All knows? Right. So, so they now, took a plaster down in the hallway here. Right. All right. So what do they do down here? This is where the damage was in the fire was down in the back in the kitchen area. As yeah. you can see, um, I just renovated the kitchen, put down new floors, and I put down new tiles in the bathroom as well. So the bathroom and the kitchen was redone. Right. But you can see the fire damage. On oh. Oh, yeah. Here's where they cut a hole right here. Now, if I look at the studs, oh, okay, look between the studs. There's a gap that leads right up there. All right, so right here, see that charring? So if the fire got into this wall cavity, it would travel up here and go right across the ceiling because up there is the roof. I can see the pitch of these rafters going down to the bearing wall there. If the fire gets in there, it would travel underneath the roof, burning the roof. As I look deeper over there, I can see another hole that they cut with new plywood covering the hole. I can see the charring on this beam right here and also on this joist or that rafter. So there was actually flame under here and that's why they open up the roof to put that flame out. Can we fix it? Absolutely. You can fix the charring but more importantly with the wall open like that you can install some type of fire blocking to stop the air from going up into these chambers. All right, sounds great.
Carol told us that this basement was filled with water the night of the fire, Richard, but uh, looks pretty dry now. The tide has subsided, thankfully. thankfully. <laughs> but most of the equipment was underwater or, or pretty much underwater. So. In terms of equipment, you want to give us a little history lesson? Well, you know, anytime I get into these buildings, this was 1905, so you think about how far we've come in 115 years or so. You know, this building originally would have been potentially coal fired. So anytime you think about that, you got to find a place where there's a window. And a, and a coal bin, so it was either here, or here's clear evidence of, of, a, of a coal bin right here. You can see the, the chute right here. They literally just dumped it through the window into a pile in your basement. Correct, and then it was just a series of, this, the first heating system was most likely a coal-fired gravity system, a big old furnace that sat down in the middle. Now you can look up and you can see evidence here of some of that original, um, here some of it's covered in asbestos, and it would have just been that the, you heated up this basement and this furnace so hot. So when you say gravity, you're talking hot air. Which, which means there was no blower, because it was before electricity, really. Or, so it would have heated up and gone up gently to the first floor, second floor, third floor. And you never thought about, yeah, here's, here's some asbestos right there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's two more right here. Right. So just different ducts up to right. different rooms and Air such. conditioning was never dreamt of. It was only, how do I survive the winter? and you would heat it enough to heat up the second, first, second, and third floor. Right. Now it looks like the owner probably, who was on the first floor, I assume, probably got sick of not being quite as comfortable. And so I see evidence here of a hydronic system. So hydronics would have come in in the early part of the 20th century. And so you could see these pipes, this radiators upstairs, and he might have had, he or she might have had a very comfortable system with its own thermostat and left the hot air for the second and third floor for the tenants. Okay. And then down here on the far end? Right, so here's the remaining equipment. You can look at his, here was the extent of the air conditioning, a window air conditioner that's been underwater and actually burned and underwater. Mm -hmm. Here's an old cast iron uh, tub on legs here, original. This wouldn't have been original, but this would have been a, a, a boiler that would have been for the first floor. And that uh, probably was underwater. Tipped on its side right there. Okay, and so this building probably would have had that big furnace right here. It was originally coal fired. Then they went to oil. The homeowner talks about having oil tanks here, and then she switched to gas in the probably the 80s and uh, something like that. And there were three separate water heaters, two furnaces, and a boiler, each individual. Now, this equipment's all been underwater, so I don't know whether we can reuse any of it. Right. But you do to... want to go back to maybe three separate systems yeah. for each unit? Yeah. yeah, you'd like to have accountability on the fuel and comfort and have each person have their own thermostat and their own hot water supply. So we still need an answer on these, and yeah. we also need an answer on the plumbing itself. That's right. Let me show you upstairs. There was a certain amount of utility in these three deckers. You know, you had three floors, three kitchens right stacked on top of one another. It meant that the kitchen sink was always in the same spot. And so too on the bathroom. The bathrooms were stacked one on top of another. The tub was always right there in the window. It's really how we got this standard five by seven bathroom in America. And it allowed the toilet to be right here next to the stack, which serviced all three bathrooms right there. Yep, okay. So you can see new pecs right here, but look at this. Here's some of the original uh, lead water. Look oh, at that. Oh, heavens. Uh -huh. That must have tasted nice. Yeah, yummy, yummy. <laughs> so if you lived on the second floor in the winter, you felt really lucky. Why is that? Well, the first floor would have been overheating because the furnace was below it. It would have been plenty warm. Too hot. Top floor would have lost a lot of its heat through the uninsulated <laughs> attic. Too cold. So the middle was just right. Perfect. Okay. So remember those registers, those ducts we saw down in the basement? Here's one of them. It comes up and it dead ends right here. And here's a register on this side. And this side, it would have come in gently. There was no fan back then. It just would have come in nice and gentle. And this Boy, place would have been perfect. And this one continues up to the top floor. The same registers would have been up there. That's right. A repeat. That's right. Nice. So in the kitchen, it certainly would not have had a gas stove like this. Originally, it would have had a kerosene or coal-fired big old stove that sat right here, right near the chimney. What could go wrong? <laughs> Invented right into here. And oftentimes, it had a thing next to it, because it was hot all the time, it had a thing next to it called a corporation, which would heat up the water off the stove. So no plumbed in hot water, it was all right there. Well, it was either plumbed in, if it was pressurized water, they would, it would be plumbed in, or if not, you take a bucket, carry it to the tub. On, that's why it was only Saturday night you might have taken a bath. Mm. One last pipe for you to identify on our history lesson. What do you think this is? Uh, well, it's too big for supply lines. It's not cast iron, so I'm going to guess a vent. Nope. Let me show you upstairs. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Should have known. So there's an industry that's not around much anymore. The coal supply person. 
He also brought kerosene. And you know what they did in the summer? They brought ice. Mm. So they would bring blocks of ice up the back stairs all the time. The door was either left open or the key was hidden. And the ice block would go into the ice chest right here. Yep. What happens when ice melts? Come on, this is a drain for so the ice box? That's absolutely, there's three of them right here. There's the no lead, way. and the water would drain right there. It was vented too? Yeah, had to be, because otherwise it wouldn't go down through the pipe. I was half right. <laughs> hey, Heath. Hey, guys. Check out what I found when I was uh, looking for some of the knob and tube wiring. Look at this mishmash. An old city gas lantern in there. Right, so city gas was only used in cities, and it was actually, they took coal, put it into a vat, and the fumes that came off the top of the coal, they would then collect and distribute to local houses. And the heat content wasn't enough to use it to heat the house, but it was just enough to be able to do gas lighting. So they'd run the small gas lines right here, and then there'd be a little shutoff called a cock and a burner right here. You'd come and light it when you needed it, like a candle right here. So, so which do you think the house originally had, the city gas or the knob and tubing? I think they might have put both in at the same time. I oh, mean, really? they're both about the same, same time period, right. and I can't imagine an opening all these walls up to right. install both. Right. They weren't sure. Both were inconsistent. They weren't sure what was going to win. They still, they'd gone from whale oil to local gas, and now this new thing called electricity. Beautiful. Okay. So, and look at this thing right here. This is actually a non-electric intercom. Oh, yeah. A tube that goes down between the third floor all the way down and the second floor, but it had a little megaphone, and you'd be able to yell down to the ice man to say, come on up. This place is a museum. It's crazy. It's great. Well, we're obviously not going to use the knob and tubing no. for wiring, no. so how's the electric in the house? Uh, let's take a look over here, and we'll get started in this corner. So you can see some more of the knob and tube that's exposed since the sure. plaster came down. But Carol actually had this house rewired about five or six years ago. Someone really took a lot of time to fish all these wires yeah. through the existing walls, leaving everything intact, putting the new service in. But now we have to look at what we have to replace. Because of the fire. Because of the fire. So part of it's easy to figure out. Some of it is simply damaged by fire. You can tell what you have to replace. But other issues are water damage. Where do we start with that? And you're just starting that process. Just starting now. All right, well, it looks like we got our hands full with this one. Right. Good luck, you, Heath. Thanks. Hey, Tommy. Charlie. Kevin. Kevin. Kevin, I'd like you to meet Russ. He's our job Perfect. foreman. Oh, terrific. Knows the area inside out, knows the city. Love and it. more than that, he knows these triple deckers inside and out. All right, well, welcome to the team, Russ. Thank you. So I know you guys have only had a little bit of time to kick it around and look at it, but Charlie, I'll start with you. Things that are concern you, top of mind for you? Uh, we're going to start where probably the big thing for me is code upgrade and budget. Yeah. Carol's retired, as you know, so somewhat of a you know limited income there. Yeah. And she wasn't expecting this. Not expecting this. And then on the budget end is the insurance claim. Right. You know, they go everything with a fine tooth comb, and we have line by line items that we really have to pay attention to. So, give me an example of how that's going to affect what you do or don't do. Perfect example right here asbestos on the old ductwork. Yeah, Richard told us that that is no go, that is old and no good. Right, so we've discovered that, you know, you know once we got here, we saw this, so this becomes part of the code upgrade yeah. that we have to pull it out. We have three different areas in the house that comes from the basement all the way to the top floor. Okay. That can burn through a lot of insurance money real quick, and the insurance company is going to be looking over our shoulder. Yeah. Be looking over our shoulder for sure, but once again, that's part of the code upgrade which is only covered to a certain percentage right, of the right. policy, so it's not unlimited. So we really have to really watch every little dime. Gotcha, okay. So Russ, you've got a lot of experience in this town with these three deckers. The mm -hmm. first thing that comes to your mind in terms of um, concern? Proper insulation. Uh, this needs to be brought up to code. Wait, did, I mean, did it ever have insulation? No. So okay. It's not been tube and you couldn't insulate it. Oh, that's, that's true, it. right. So anything we do will be obviously a big improvement. Uh, you can see we have areas that are already open, so they'll be easily accessible. Mm -hmm. um, but others are still closed in, and hopefully those ones will get from outside, either moving some of the vinyl siding, making holes and filling from that way, or from the inside with um, making more holes inside of the plaster. Right. Maybe just little holes through the plaster where you have to. And there you go, and then we'll patch because we're going to be plastering anyways when, once we get inside. Yeah, all in your exterior wall. Right here. I mean, this is an interior, but we've got a lot of places where it's plaster on one wall and wide open on the other. Right. Exactly. What have you seen, Tommy? Well, an old house like this, if it's not a total gut work, you got to think about the new heating and cooling system that's going to go in. So you got to run the duct work. So now we've got a part of the house, most of the house, a lot of the plaster isn't coming down. How are you going to get the duct work from point A to point B without doing extra demo and extra repair work? Mm -hmm. So you've got to modify the system somehow on each level to get that duct work in with least intrusion. 
So a lot of challenges anyway with triple deckers. Insurance is, you know, on top of that. I know Carol has. Uh, she's working with an insurance adjuster, someone to represent her. Yeah. And I'm actually going to go meet with him and see what else I can learn. Yeah, good luck. All right. Great thanks, time. guys. Yeah. So this should be fun. Good. All right. Yeah. Carol had fire insurance, and she clearly had a fire. So most people might think it is as simple as the insurance company sending her a check for the size of the policy. Well, it is not that simple. And because it isn't, she has reached out for help to someone who's called a public adjuster. Dan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Kim. So let's start with what is a public adjuster? And so we're licensed by the state to prepare, present, and negotiate an insurance claim on behalf of the policyholder. Okay, so you're working for Carol, the homeowner, representing her with the insurance company. That's and what are you, you're kind of going head to head with them saying, oh, it's not worth this much, it should be worth more. Yeah, well, we're going to come and we're going to take all the inspections. Uh -huh. We're going to handle all the communications for the insured. And we're going to deal with the insurance company directly. And so does your expertise include knowing what things cost in a neighborhood like this, on a house like this? That's correct. And we're also going to use the software that the insurance company uses to create an Xactimate estimate in 3D to depict the actual damages that happened on this property. Gotcha, all right. And so where are we in the process? So currently we just did an inspection after demolition and we're gonna be looking forward to doing the code inspection. Yeah, I just next. heard a lot about that where we're gonna to have to, we're gonna be required to upgrade certain systems in the house, maybe the staircase in the back. You can help us with that, you can? Correct, correct. So we wanna make sure there's no overlap in any costs that have already been paid for. Right. We wanna separate out that code and we want to bill that separately and it has to be incurred, then the insured will be reimbursed. Gotcha, okay. All right, well, uh, as I say, a big undertaking, so we appreciate that you are helping us out with this and helping Carol out with it as well. Thanks for having me. You got it, thank you. Gonna get ready to start pretty no soon. Pretty excited, huh? Carol, it sounds like you're gonna get some new numbers from your adjuster soon, so that should be good news. That's good news. Well, this is my sister, Willie. Hi, Willie, nice you? to meet you. You were living here, right? Yes, I was on the oh, first right. floor. You're going to help us put it back together? Yes, I am. <laughs> Are you? She's going to help with the designs. Oh, terrific. That's yeah. awesome. That's all right. Well, Sisters we're, working together. We're going to need all the help we can get, right? So, Tom, what are you thinking about next week? Next week, we're going to get ready to get that asbestos out of here so we can start with more demo. I like to hear it. All right. Well, it sounds like you guys are finally on your road to getting back home, so that is exciting. Yeah. And we're going to give you all of that and more next week. So from all of us here in Dorchester, I'm Kevin O'Connor for This Old House. So weren't you the one who ran back into the house like three times? <laughs> what were you thinking? Next time on This Old House. While this building is wide open, it's a perfect time to analyze the drain, waste, and vent plumbing and see what we can reuse. And for that, Ronette Taylor, Ronnie Taylor, is going to be our master plumber on this job. How are you? How you doing, Richard? Good. Yeah. How'd this happen? How'd you get into the plumbing game? Um, I met somebody when I was working out in the construction arena 30, 30. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Started dating me. Then I wind up marrying the guy. You got hooked on the guy and on plumbing. On plumbing, yeah. <laughs> yeah.